Welcome into a new Buff Stampede Radio. Adam Munster Tiger, the publisher of BuffStampede.com on the 24-7 Sports Network, joined by football analyst William Gardner. For as long as I can remember, we've done a top 40 Buffs countdown on BuffStampede.com in the weeks leading up to preseason camp. Number 30 is offensive lineman Jack Wilty. William, you and I both had him on our list. Brian did not include him in us on his top 40 list, but you know, this is a guy that showed really well working primarily with the first team offensive line yeah. at right guard during spring ball. And this is a guy that I was highest on in terms of, you know, those incoming junior college offensive linemen. Isaiah Jada was a first team Juco All-American where Wilty was second team, but I just liked his film a little bit more, and I thought it would be a little bit more natural for him to move and play guard in this offense. And uh, he's somebody that since the first time I've I've heard about him transferring in and I started to do more and more research on him, I I really uh, like what he brings to the mix. And I'd be surprised if he's not one of the five starting offense linemen on this team. I'm going to tell you right now, everybody's missing the bus on Jack Wilty. Everybody, because everybody says, oh, you know, baby's going to take his spot or this guy's going to take his spot. Jack Wilty's going to start every game and he's going to be a hard nosed, blue collar, badass offensive lineman because he's a tough guy and he's 6'5, 320. So he's got the size and the athleticism, but he's got that mentality of, I want to bury you, man. You know, now you look at, you look at a Tyler Brown and you're like, that's a guy you send to the combine and they go bananas over, right? Yeah. Jack Wilty is maybe not that guy, but uh, he's got that. I'm trying to think of, a, of an old school CU offensive guard that, that you know, that, that it would be a good comparison. But uh, he's a tough guy. He's big. He's strong. He's powerful. He's hardworking. And, and I just think Jack Wilty is going to be a superior offensive lineman at this level. Today's episode is brought to us by Macaulay Capital Fractional CFO Services. Is your business looking for financial guidance and support, but not yet big enough to hire a full-time CFO? Well, we have a solution for you. Hiring a fractional CFO who can work with your business on a part-time basis. You get the benefit of having a seasoned financial expert on your team without the commitment or expense of a full-time hire. And here's the best part. It's likely that a partnership with Macaulay Capital will be a win-win situation meaning that your business will make more money from the guidance of a fractional CFO than the total cost of partnering with us. For more information or to set up a meeting, please visit MacaulayCapital.com. That's M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y Capital.com. Number 29, you're not going to like this one, William. It's punter Mark Vassett, uh, who transferred in from Louisville. I had him pretty high on my list. I knew you were going to include him on your list. So I had him at number 18. And- I'm going to break in on you though. And, and, and tell you, I didn't, didn't uh, not include the kickers and the punters this year out of just, you know, anti-kicker punter spite. I don't know anything about these guys. I haven't seen what they can do. So I don't know if they're any good or not. Well, Mark Vassett averaged 44.6 yards per punt during a sophomore campaign at Louisville and that was good enough for third in the ACC. And That's his punting, Kentucky. they they got his, thin air, they got thin air in Kentucky. His punting average this past season set a new Louisville record with a minimum minimum of twenty five punts. So you said we haven't seen him, but uh, he's already played at the Power Five level and done pretty darn well. Maybe I, maybe I should just admit that I was too lazy to go really look and see what he did <laughs> <laughs> because he's a punter. So okay, you got me. Well, he's the only specialist on this list. Now, there's guys that are safeties and other yeah. positions that are going to have an impact on special teams. But in terms yeah. of the true specialist, this is it. Uh, but, you know, that was a position that's been pretty solid for them. Uh, Josh Watts was pretty good last year in that role. Uh, the, the thing with the puncher position is those poor guys have just had to be utilized more than uh, yeah. than you'd like they them to. Higher play count than anybody else on the team. It's it's incredible, you know, the workout. Yeah. You got to go, you go all the way back to to Dara O'Neill, who uh, was, you know, back in 2011 was their best football player, was their punter, yeah. um, and they've had some other guys come through here, and and uh, yeah, Watts was was last year's guy. It just they've had bitch production at the punter position, but um, yeah. it's because a lot of a lot of it is because they've gotten so much work that uh, 
you know, I think that's part of it. But ho- hopefully we don't see a whole lot of Mark Vassett this year then. Right. All right, number 28 is safety Miles Slusher. William, you and I both had him number 24 on our list. Brian did not. Brian opted for some other safeties on his list. Slusher saw action in 23 games and recorded a total of 93 tackles during three seasons at Arkansas. He uh, played 335 defensive snaps last season. I was talking with our, our Arkansas publisher, Trey Biddy, and he said that when healthy, Miles Slusher was probably their best or second best defensive back, but uh, he was dealing with some injuries and uh, actually had to get sidelined a little bit with some of the stuff he was dealing with. But uh, he said that he's got NFL potential. And so that's, I, I put a lot of my stock into what folks out there in Arkansas said about Miles Slusher. And uh, again, there's a lot of guys at safety where you maybe you're splitting hairs, but um, he's going to be a guy that that's going to be hard to keep off the field. Right. Well, he's a legit SEC defensive back who played a lot in that conference and played well, you know, and repeatedly year after year. So um, I'm not, I, I'd be curious to know why, why, Brian doesn't think it more highly of him, but uh, uh, I, I I look at him like, like we kind of a no brainer, right? I mean, you started for a couple of years in the SEC, certainly you're going to start here, right? So, or at least be in the mix and playing a lot. So, I, I think he's a, a kind of a can't miss guy. He seems a little bit small to me to be a sure thing NFL guy, but um, what do I know about defensive backs? <clears throat> Uh, number 27 is linebacker Brennan Gant, another guy that was on all of our lists. Now, he is not on campus yet, but he's expected to join the team soon. Brennan Gant transitioned from safety to linebacker during his time at Florida State, saw action in 43 games with the Seminoles, recorded 112 tackles. So, got a lot better during his time at Florida State, saw a lot of action, hasn't got that summer work in with the bus, which is something that might put him a little bit behind the eight ball going into camp. But in the day and age of spread offenses, this is a guy that you really like having in the linebackers room because he's got that history at safety and he can get moving. He's got speed that, that's better than the average you know, linebacker from 10, 20, 30 years ago. Well, you know, and that's, that's what uh, – during, during that stretch when Florida State had like 15 years in a row – where they didn't have anything, where they had like 10 win, ten wins every season, right? That's what they did on defense was they took safeties and made them into linebackers and took linebackers and made them into defensive end. They just outran everybody. And that's exactly what he is, you know, 6'2", 210. Um, I, I'm not sold yet on the depth in the inside linebacker room. Um, so I'm looking forward to Gant coming in and helping us with that. But with his speed, you know, you can put him out there and – um, like you said, you know, we're not going to see, we're not going to see a whole lot of, you know, double tight end running up the middle kind of teams where we need, uh, Nate Hammer, Lamon in there. Right. Uh, but I think Brendan Gant fits perfectly into the modern type of, of defense and modern type of offense. So I'm excited about him. And, you know, like you said, he's, he's an older guy, got a kid, a little more mature and had some experience and, and I think he brings a lot to the table besides just the playing ability. I don't think it'd be a starter because I think I think other guys are better than him to be the starter, but I think uh, he gives you a different thing you can do in a nickel situation, maybe, um, you know, or put a third linebacker in there, and it, it really gives uh, some, um, some um, flexibility to the defensive coordinator. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going up to number 26 now, and this is where Edge Taj Alston comes in on all of our lists. I had him at 30, you had him at 23, Brian at 34. Taj Alston was out this spring as he came back from a shoulder surgery, but he's got an impressive frame, William. And uh, I talked to the folks that covered him out at West Virginia. They talked about how versatile he was, that he played everywhere from interior defensive line to stand up outside linebacker. And so he brings a lot of versatility in there, and uh, I like I like just the way he looks coming off the bus, right? I, I think he's one of the all buff yeah. bus team guys on this football team, and um, he's a guy that uh, he's got uh, something to prove, but he's already done quite a bit at the college yeah. level. And I think uh, who, uh, I'm blanking on who's our edge coach. Um, 
Nick Williams. Nick Williams. I remember a video in the spring with Nick Williams on the elevator with with Todd Alston and, and and Williams just kind of glowing about you know how when we get this guy back he's gonna make all the difference in the world and and I remember that interview with uh, some that you did with some of the people from West Virginia they talked about how he played every single position on the front front five any any one of those positions and he did them all well he wasn't spectacular at, at any one thing but he did every single different type of thing well so he can he's a guy who can play well against the run he can give you some pass rush you know he, he had some sacks in his background uh he's another one like brendan gant who gives you a lot of versatility on defense right you're not going to line him up and say hey you know back that center up you know be a 320 pound nose guard and push the line that's not what he that's not his game but you can put him at every single spot on that line in spot details. Um, and I think he gives you a whole lot. I think he can give you an inside pass rush. They can give you an outside pass rush. Um, and I think he's hard nosed and gritty. And I like that. One thing that's great about a lot of these guys, we're not sure if they're going to start or if they're going to be a depth piece is the guys that kind of fall a little bit more into that depth area is the versatility that seems to be kind of a common theme with a lot of these guys, which is important when you don't necessarily have a full 85 scholarship guys. Uh, you have pieces that you can move around, you know, I think in the front seven more so than we've seen at Colorado recently. Well, you know, I, I've coached offensive line, I've coached defensive line. And, and I was think uh, I was talking to somebody about it yesterday about how, you know, in a season and in a game, man, sometimes you're playing, you're, you're, you're like doing a jigsaw puzzle, right? And maybe put this guy in at that spot, put this guy in at that situation, you know, and it's third and third and nine. We know they're going to throw. And I grab a guy and say, look, you're going to go in there. You haven't practiced this position, but here's what you're going to do. And you're going to get something done. And I think Taj Alston is that kind of a guy that you, you just grab him and say, Taj, here's what we need on this play. Go make it happen. Number 25 is offensive lineman, Jack Bailey. I did not have him on my list. I mentioned that Jack Wilson is a guy that I see uh, being a starting offensive lineman. So I went with him instead of Bailey. Uh, but well, only one he, Jack allowed on the offensive line. <laughs> well, I, I like some other guys and we'll get into that. Yeah, but, no, fair enough. I, but I but know, Brian, Brian enough. had him number 10 on his list. And I'm going to get his thoughts on that in a future yeah. video. But uh, I'm just surprised at that. Now, I get that he played for Bill O'Boyle and Sean Lewis at Kent State. So he's got that familiarity which is going to be helpful right. for him but I, I think he's going to be a big depth piece a guy that can play both guard spots but for me I just don't see I see him more as kind of that six or seventh or maybe even eighth guy in that yeah. offensive lineman group as opposed to being one of the top five guys there well one of the things you know like um when Bill O'Boyle's talking about him he talks about how he's a tough guy and he knows this offense inside and out so those are two things that make a big difference but what is obvious about Jack Bailey, both in terms of his measurements and seeing him out there on the field, he's noticeably smaller. You know, he's noticeably smaller than those other guys. He's, you know, going around 290, which, you know, back in the day was huge, but is not so big these days. Now, this offense does not require those big road grading, you know, massive offensive linemen. So I think Jack Bailey is a good fit for this offense because, you know, you turning and running and moving laterally and this, that, and the other thing. But the fact that he knows this offense and has played in it for what three years, four years, he's going to be able to. He's a guy again that 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 you know, Bill O'Boyle. If somebody goes down, you get hey, Bailey, get in there, take these two snaps, man. You know, you don't got to tell him what to do because he knows the offense and he knows how Bill O'Boyle wants things done, so he can help guys with drills. You know, one of the hardest things about coaching the offensive line, you got you got. 15, 16 guys out there and just teaching them how to do the drills and do them right. You know, yeah. here's a guy that's been through that for two or three years can, you know, can, can go to a Jack Wilton and go, no, 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 man, put, you put your hand up here. You put this foot down there and get your pads like this and, and can kind of be almost a coach on the field, you know, the whole cliche like that. But I think Bailey brings more to this team than just whether he's going to be a starter or not. And I don't think he'll be a starter. And it's so valuable for them this time of year right now, right? When they're doing a lot of the right. player-led one-on-ones, player-led drills. Yeah, it, it's it's an extension of Bill O'Boyle that Savion yeah. Washington and, and Bailey have. They, they know exactly what the position coach wants out of these different drills. Well, I saw that, you know, that one video about 18 minutes or so of one-on-one O-line, D-line. 
Jack Bailey was showing real leadership in that thing and keeping it moving and getting people back online. And, you know, John right back at, at, at Bishop Thomas and some of those, you know, barking dogs, you know, on, on that side of the ball. And, and I, and I was really impressed by the leadership he brought in that moment without a coach out there. Yeah. I'll tell you that day that D line didn't make enough plays to be chirping as much as they were. Well, that's, yeah, that's what I was like. I was like that there, you guys are not killing it and nobody on either side, you know, the, the two people that stood out to me really on either side was um, Ben Resnick, who's a walk on offensive tackle looked really good. And then um, Wells looked really good to me out there, but everybody else was like, you guys are yapping, but you're not doing much. Yeah, again, take a lot of that stuff with a grain of salt because you know, they used to have open practices at Colorado, and I would go out there for every practice, every minute of every practice during camp, and this is back when they did two-a-days, and so you'd see so many one-on-ones, you know, DBs, receivers going at it, and then also the linemen, and right. Day by day, you'd have you think you'd have these firm impressions of these guys, and then it could kind of flip itself on its head the next right. day, and kind of so you, you. It's really about the body of work, and sometimes when you're only getting right. video of the one on ones once every couple of weeks with that group, uh, you don't know what's happening those other days when you don't have that footage, right? So right. I think that's I think worth that, mentioning. Yeah, and I think also you know that goes back to like people look at like six minutes of of offensive linemen highlights in high school and make a judgment about a guy that's i guarantee you bill o'boyle ain't watching that highlight film he's watching all the other plays because it's all the other plays um that tell you whether this guy can play for you or not right yeah so um you know when they pick out their own highlights great marvelous let me look at your whole like you said your whole body of work in an entire game and it's going to show me something very different um, so, yeah, I think, you know, you, you see one like a, people, oh, hey, you burned that guy. OK, you know what? There ain't an offensive tackle alive that ain't been burned off the edge. Yeah. If, unless you're sitting on a bench, you know, you know, Nate Solder got, you know, he, he got smoked before and so did David Bakhtiari. And they're as good as it gets because that's that's the nature of the game. The guy across the line is not a stiff either. And that's why it's so important to get out and get in-person evaluations. And maybe the casual fan doesn't understand why it's so important for these coaches to be on the road as much as they are. But you and I have gone out to so many different football events to evaluate recruits. And isn't it amazing how much different your perception can change when you actually see these guys in person? And you have a pretty good track record, especially with the offensive linemen of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, try to be positive with them, but sometimes you'll say, you know, I'm not sure about that guy. And for the most part, those guys have not panned out at Colorado. If you've had that feeling about them. Yeah. Which is, so I, you, you, we need to post that on the board. Cause they're like, Oh, you guys, you, you I, that's cause the guys that I don't think are going to make it. I, I don't like to talk negatively about a kid. So I don't say that, you know, but uh, it is interesting. Sometimes you look at a guy, and, and you just know he just can't move as well well enough or he just, uh, you know, like um, the kid from Denver South five, six, seven years ago. Tariq Roberts. It's like we went to that game and I was 100%, 100% sure he could not play at this level after watching that game. He just didn't have it. And I could, you know, I couldn't, I mean, if I had time to sit down with you and show you every single play, I could tell you why, but I can't necessarily put it into words. I just, it's like Bill O'Boyle said about, you know, I know I want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that that's a skill. That's an artwork is being able to piece together all the information you have with the recruit going, you know, from one end to the transcripts all the way to right. uh, what they're like in the weight room with their teammates. And you've got to piece together so much stuff and, uh, to have that radar to where you can then have a conversation with a recruit and sift through some of the BS and really get a, a picture of who that kid is, uh, is something that's kind of overlooked. You know, a lot of these stars are based on production and not necessarily uh, the type of person and, and worker they are. So a lot of those guys can be busts at the next level, whereas uh, these college coaches that have their uh, their their paycheck has relied on being smart with these evaluations. And so there's a lot of pressure on them to get it right. And Bill O'Boyle to this point, I've kind of appreciated the guys he's brought in, but 
Um, I know that they haven't necessarily been, you know, the four or five star guys that, that get the fans excited. Yeah, but I think what he values is that blue collar, hard work, and and I and I've always said one of the hardest things to determine about an offensive line recruit is how much does he want it, how hard will he work, because how do you how do you piece that together until you see it, until you put him in, you know, with Coach Mo and see whether he can hack it or not, and there's really no way to know, you know, and you you talk to the assistant coaches in high school, you talk to the janitor, you talk to the teachers, and everybody got their piece of 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 what they, what they think, but you don't know how a guy will, I'm, let me put it this way. You can be the highest rated five-star in the history of, of football coming out of high school. And you have to work extremely hard and continue to get better to make it at this level, no matter how high you're rated in high school. And if you don't have that work ethic, you ain't going to make it. And I've seen a couple of guys, you know, you know, a couple of guys I've seen who uh, were super highly rated, and they just didn't want it enough. It just, it didn't mean enough to them, you know. And and yeah. sometimes that's not a bad thing. It's like, you know, guy's got a happy life, nice girlfriend, school's going good. Doesn't really need this the way Nate Lamon needs this. And I don't know why Nate Lamon. You know, that's not a knock on Nate either. He needs this game, man. In in his heart and soul, he needs to play this game. Yeah. And some guys don't have that. Well, it's important if you're going to stop playing football and you're on scholarship that you've got a solid plan B like an Eric Olson where, you know, he's right. going to go back right. into his engineering. Uh, right. On the flip side of that, Daryl Scott would be the example as Colorado analyst that we'd have to point out of the number one ranked running back in the entire country coming out in the class of 2008. And he didn't have that work ethic. The one time he had a work ethic was uh, the the spring after his uh, true freshman season, and he got down his weight and was a starter in spring ball. But he just let himself go and uh, transferred, went down to Florida and, and played okay. But he uh, he left college after his junior year and thought he was going to be an NFL guy just based on his reputation coming out of high school. And right. th those guys, it's sad that they can't see right. their deficiencies and their lack of work ethic until it's too late. And right. Daryl Scott is one of those great, guys. Yeah. They've been told how great they are. And, you know, I don't know. And then I think, you know, I think about an Eric Olson and I think also maybe, you know, there's not a lot of big defensive backs and safeties playing high school football in Colorado. You get up to this level and you start getting thumped by the likes of Tedrick Thompson and guys like that. It's a different game, man. And maybe it ain't so much fun anymore. Yeah. And number 24 is running back Cavossier Smoke. He was in the 20s on all three of our lists. He had a 5.42 yards per carry average in 46 career games at Kentucky, which ranks seventh all time in Wildcats history. He started early on last season when the Wildcats star back was suspended. So William, a guy that's played a lot of football, has a really good looking frame. But before they got Alton McCaskill, the fourth, there was this feeling that Cavosier smokes really good, but he really can't be their, their lead back, right? And so I think having McCaskill come in, put smoke in a much better position where he's going to play a lot. And I think he's going to impact this football program, but He's not a guy that you have to rely on to be your your bell cow type back. Yeah, you know, and I and I think you know we, we've mentioned the 2001 team a couple of times, and they went three deep with fantastic running backs, and and you know having those other guys can make you be better because you get your spots. You don't have to be in there every time, and, and when you go in, you're fresh, and maybe the, the coach uses you in a situation that's more suited to your skills. And so you know, I think I think Smoke is is at 24. He might be a little bit higher, except for some of the guys that are also playing running back on this team now. Yeah. Number 23 is another guy that I really like. And we talked about versatility a little while ago. And Jeremiah Brown exudes that that word versatility. Uh, he was number 17 on my list, number 32 on your list, William, number 26 on Brian's list. This is a guy that's expected to play both the traditional inside linebacker role but can also play off the edge as well. And so you're going to see him use that flexibility on defense. Um, and that's what was kind of his calling card when he was at Jackson State. Uh, we saw him come into Colorado this spring and have a big play in the spring game on special teams, blocking a field goal. So that's another area where he's going to have an impact. And 
Uh, he's got a good personality and a, a great yeah. smile. And yeah. uh, you can tell that he's going to be one of the, you know, the featured guys in terms of all the documentaries they're making out uh, with coach prime being at the helm and Boulder. So uh, 23 is a good spot for him. I yeah. feel like even though um, th there might be guys that play a little bit more snaps than him yeah. uh, on defense. And he's another one kind of like Taj Alston, where it's not entirely clear what he is. You know, he's not a traditional and hasn't, been a traditional inside linebacker guy um he's been more of a outside linebacker pass rush kind of guy and i was a little disappointed in spring ball that he didn't have more jump off the edge um in that role but i think moving him to more of a hybrid position and i i i think of it and i don't know how they're gonna run it on the defense but i feel like he's a, like a kenneth olick Bodie kind of guy you know oh who can get out there in the flats and really do some things for you, but can also get a pass rush from time to time or whatever. And again, gives you a lot of versatility on defense because you can put him in there and say, okay, I want you to rush the passer, rush the passer through the B gap, right. Or uh, get out there and run with this tight end. And he can do that because he's phenomenally athletic and has a good work ethic. So he's a guy I think that's going to make some things happen. Uh, even if he's not one of the 11 starters on defense. You're talking about filling gaps. This next guy on the countdown can clog some gaps uh, in the trenches. And the, at number 22 is Leonard Payne Jr., a defensive lineman. Uh, he was on all of our lists, uh, started 10 games during his time at Fresno State. And uh, talking to the folks out there that covered him at Fresno State, they say that it, when he was healthy, he was really, really good, had NFL-type potential. He did have some injuries that, that kept him from being the best version of himself at times, but he started in their bowl game last year and had a big impact. And so uh, you like that he was one of the few guys that worked with Sal Sanzari this spring. And right. uh, you know, I didn't quite know if I should have him higher on my list. I'm, I'm kind of glad that our votes together put him at number 22 because, uh, uh, again, I think he's going to be able to fill some of those gaps. Yeah, and I think, you know, he's a 6'3", 3'10". He's that big body that we can use inside to uh, stuff the run and uh, things of that nature. But, you know, looking I, – I took a long look at his – because he's not a punter. I took a long look at his background at Florida State. <laughs> um, and he was very impressive. Um, and I can't remember exactly where he is in terms of his eligibility. But two years ago, he was a damn, damn good defensive tackle and really – very good, had a really good year and was really on his way and then had injury problems last year, but then got healthy for that bowl game. And he was dominant, really had a huge impact in that bowl game. So he's a guy that's got the body and the length and the size to really make a difference inside. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to have him. I'd like to have two of them, but uh, I think he'll be, he's certainly to me uh, very clearly one of the starters on that defensive line. He is a senior, so this is going to be it for him. Okay. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate with you know him and Chance Main and, and Taj Alston. I mean, they've they've got to get what they can get out of themselves in Boulder this year because this is it for them. Right. Uh, we are finally at some point here, pretty soon, going to get past um, the, the strange deal that was created by COVID and eligibility not counting in 2020. It's it's taken some math work to figure out. Uh, how many years of eligibility some of these right. guys have left? Because you really have to zone in on 2020 and go, right. okay, we subtract that year. What other years did they play? And so um, he's one of those guys that uh, is very experienced. And, and uh, despite 2020 not counting, he's he's going to be a senior this year. At number 21, this is the last guy we're going to talk about on this podcast, William. It's safety Trevor Woods. I hit him at nine. I had him at 19. You had him at number 17, Brian at 25. So we were pretty close with our expectations for Trevor Woods. Uh, he led CU and ranked fifth in the Pac-12 in tackles per game last season, graded out as the Buffalo's top defender by Pro Football Focus, and then earned his number from the new coaches this spring, uh, somebody that Coach Prime had uh, you know, positive words for at one of his press conferences in the spring. And uh, he's he's unlike a lot of the guys we've talked about today, William, he's not going to be a guy that's going to seek out the camera. He just wants to play ball and make big plays and right. let his game do the talking. Blue collar, throwback, Texas kid. Uh, right. I love Trevor Woods. Yeah, hard hitter, you know, really, really, really brings the wood. And uh, I think I think a lot of people 
downgrade him simply because he was on last year's team. And I don't think that's fair um, because his play was certainly better than what that defense as a whole showed. Um, and he certainly got uh, uh, the potential to be a, a very good safety. Um, I think it, it, it's funny that we're cutting off right here because these next right after Trevor was our, our next here, here's a teaser to bring everybody back right here. These three spots are fairly controversial and, and, and uh, look at our voting because we got three safeties in a row and we're really on very different pages with some of these guys. Um, but with Trevor Woods, I think we're all pretty close to the same uh, level of where we put him. Um, and, and I, I believe he's going to start at one of those safety spots and, uh, I think he'll do very well. And the only, only knock against him is he, he plays with such reckless, crazy abandon that he tends to get nicked up. And yeah. so we'll have to see how that goes. And then, you know, there's also the targeting issue where he is a guy that will stick his head in there because uh, that's the brand of football that he's used to. And and I will get him in trouble at times. And that's another reason that safety is a position you want to have a lot of depth at because of targeting and because of the fact that you need guys from safety position on special teams, the fact that guys can get banged up at that position because they are playing, you know, they are, they are having to come up sometimes in the open field and put their body out there. So um, it's great to have a lot of safeties on the list, but I think the reason that we are so close together on Trevor Woods and not so much with some of the other safeties is because all three of us, William, saw Trevor Woods the last two years on Boulder. So we have this bigger sample size to go from in terms of our expectations. Some of these other guys, it's just kind of based on spring ball or a little bit of what we heard from their last stop. And it's it's really challenging to put this list together, but uh, it does generate some great discussion here yeah. in July before yeah. camp kicks off. Well, as I said, the next three guys we're going to talk about are going to be big fireworks, big uh, controversy. I love it, William. Thanks Not on for this podcast. What? What? Well, I appreciate you for teasing the, the next podcast. You make yeah. my job easy when you do that. Yeah, we're, we're going to start off right off the bat throwing knuckles. All right. Well, that's it for this first part of our Top Buffs Countdown Breakdown. Again, head to buffstampede.com for a little bit more added on each of these guys that are part of our Top 40 Buffs Countdown. We'll be back before camp kicks off with – the the top 20 guys on this list because we've we've got to get this out before they start preseason camp because once that happens William there's going to be a lot of movement in terms of guys that are uh, exceeding right. or not living up to what our expectations are right now right absolutely and, and and I think it'd be interesting especially when they start getting the pads on I mean all all the offensive and defensive line stuff means nothing until they get pads on because you know guys out there in shorts it's like okay defense it, you know, it, it that one-on-one -on -one drill, offensive lineman and defensive lineman without pads on, is kind of ridiculous. It's not, it's not meaningful. It's like a defensive lineman. Let, let's see you do that move with pads on and trying to get through. There's a center and here's a guard. Get through that gap and, and do that. So yeah. that's what I'm looking forward to seeing and seeing where some of these guys sort of fall out. But um, I, I really like, I really like our top 20 guys. I think our top 20 guys is the best top 20 guys we've done ever. Yeah. Right. I don't think there's much much of a debate there, to be honest right. with you. I mean, it's it's going to be exciting to talk about these guys because every single one of them, I'm like, woohoo! Yeah. So. 2016, you could go back at the end of the season and go, wow, okay, this list is way better than we thought it was in the preseason. Right. But right. Um, I can't think of another year that would be anywhere close in terms of the right. top 20 guys, right. uh, just in terms of overall talent level that they have. So, uh, right. And and looking at the voting, we were all pretty close to the same page on almost everybody except a couple of guys. We were not in agreement with number one. So going all yeah, the way up to number one, there's going to be. Yeah. Uh, which, which I thought that would be a sure thing, but I see why it's not. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get there. Um, and, and, and you guys don't know your offensive tackles. I'm just going to say that we'll, we'll address it on the next podcast. All right. All right. Fair enough. Well, that teases our next show. Hopefully, folks, you guys enjoyed this. You know, it's July. There's going to be so much discussion to talk about in August, and it's just trying to get to that point. And I think doing some exercises like this gives everybody, especially with the roster overhaul, just kind of a, a better feeling for the personnel on this team. And even these exercises help me out. I don't know if it helps you out, William. Yeah, absolutely. You, you kind of have to take a – 
deeper dive into who these guys are. I mean, you know, it's been such a whirlwind. Honest to God, there are names out there that I don't even know they were on a team. You know, you see them in a video or you hear them in a – see somebody post about them on a post. I'm like, that guy's on this team? Oh, okay, he's one of those – you know, there, there was a rush of period of time there when so many guys were coming in and I couldn't keep up with them all. Yeah. That's yeah. why I've tried to do a lot of comprehensive lists in the last six months, yeah. because uh, not only do I feel like that helps organize things for CU fans, it helps me organize things in my own head. Right. Uh, Brian and I were out doing a video in front of the flat irons one day and I didn't have notes. I didn't have a cheat sheet, but Brian had to pull his out a couple of times because there are so many new guys that we're just learning about. Yeah. And uh, a year from now, you know, with, with, there'll be more returning guys and we'll have more of that history of watching them in the CU program. It should be easier, but yeah, this is unprecedented at CU at the power five level. I know the folks that followed Deion Sanders at Jackson state got, got used to this early on in his tenure there, but uh, we're still trying to wrap our heads around it here in Boulder. Well, and the other thing is, you know, because they haven't been here before, it's like when you see them in the weight room, I, I don't recognize a lot of these guys, you know, and thank God m many of them have the name on their back of their shirt. I'm like, turn around, turn that guy around, turn that guy around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some, some, of them, some of them are already such characters like, you know, Bishop Thomas. I recognize that guy immediately now. Yeah. You know, yeah. Got that just the way he's built and got that little gap in his teeth. And he and he, the guy, the guy, I can hear him all the way over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome william thanks to you and brian for taking the time out to to participate in their voting for this countdown and william uh, extra thanks for for coming on taking a break from work today to talk about uh you know a bunch of these guys and, and we'll have to do this again soon again we got to get that that other podcast out before camp starts up but uh always appreciate you and appreciate everybody out there for tuning in